mailing. Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Hugh Devereaux Mac is returning to the show today because there are a few things firearms related that I want to talk to him about. And I'll certainly raise Gareth's interaction with the police that is all over social media. And then I'll chat to him about the dishonesty of police association boss Chris Carhill. Welcome back to The Crunch, Hugh Devereaux Mac from Colfo. Uh, you know, Hugh, I, I didn't think I was going to have you on the show quite so soon after our last interview, but it's been a lot happening. Look, uh, with all the changes that are happening around gun reform and all the news that keeps coming out day to day, it's uh, unsurprising we're back so quickly. Let's start off with um, Chris Carhill. We'll get that out of the way. Um, I, I wrote, wrote an article on Tuesday calling him a functional idiot. And I saw you had a press release put out on Tuesday, which was a bit more polite than me, but um, essentially the same thing, calling out Chris Carhill for just making stuff up. Yeah, so obviously, um, for those who don't know, Chris Carhill has recently gone after uh, Minister McKee, saying that she is not the right person to be leading the uh, the firearms law, rev uh, law review because she was a gun lobbyist beforehand and therefore she's always automatically biased. Now, one of the first things to clear up is that she's never been a paid gun lobbyist. Um, the role that I now hold and that she held previously, it's all voluntary. The only reason we do this is because we care about our community and we were sick of watching them get treated poorly following the Christchurch terror attack. That's what brought me in and that's what got her into parliament because she cared enough to stand up for her community. Um, and for the record, while she was with Colfo, she actually lobbied against the Ardern chaired uh, committee that weakened gun, law for, gun laws when they cut the budget to the police vetting process. The, uh, the police budgets were cut. Uh, that meant that the licensing team had less money to work with. And so they started cutting corners, which potentially, although Cahill has said Nicole's work as a pro gun lobbyist contributed to Christchurch, which is outrageous beyond belief. Her work actually was trying to prevent something like Christchurch happening. So to get that out of the way, um, Cahill is, I would never call him a functional idiot because I think he's very good at what he's doing. I think he's trying to set himself up in a role in politics after he leaves the police union, which may be having to come sooner rather than later, considering his botch pay negotiations on their behalf recently. Mm -hmm. um, but he is a paid lobbyist. He is on the police payroll but he's also not subject to IPCA, which is an interesting loophole for him. Mm, totally. You know, I, I had a lot of respect for Greg O'Connor and still do. Um, when he was in that role, he seemed to take a a more conciliatory approach to, you know, problem areas like, like firearms law. You know, I had a couple of meetings with him uh, a couple of times that would talk about various different issues. Just really pleasant guy to deal with. I can't say the same for for Cahill and, and the police association, particularly with the emotive way that they are uh, spreading actually misinformation. Like if you want to, you know, knock on the door of people who are spreading misinformation, go and knock on Cahill's door because he's just making stuff up. Like, like for example, what we're talking about now, he's come out against the minister because he says that police association hasn't been included in public consultation for the, for the new um, the, the revised bill. Well, consultation hasn't opened yet. Mm. <laughs> no, you're completely right. Yeah, And I mean, he's not the only one who's uh, come out in the media. Gun Control New Zealand and this new group, Keeping Our Communities Safe, as well as uh, a few others, have said, we haven't been involved in the consultation process and it's shady, trying to undermine Minister McKee's process. Realistically, all that's happened is a scoping document to figure out, okay, What's the lay of the land before we even start drafting a bill? And in fact, Cahill has sort of his public temper tantrums that he's had in the media are exactly why the police association and the union have not been included in these discussions, because he's proven he hasn't got the fit and proper temperament to be part of that. Police, however, as in the real police run by the commissioner, are part of the minister's advisory arms forum and FCAF, which is the firearms um, advisory committee, which gun control New Zealand and others sit on. It's a joint 
working group across multiple beliefs, pro and anti-gun, who work together to create good laws. That's how it should be. Kahu isn't fit to have one of those positions, which is why he was excluded. Now, one of the statements he made to the New Zealand Herald and other media was that Nicole McKee had obstructed uh, law changes that would have prevented the Christchurch massacre, ignoring completely that the Royal Commission found clear and obvious failings on the on behalf of the police uh, in the vetting process for giving this clown a, a license in the first place. Yeah, absolutely, and it, that is be it's undeniable that the police failed us. The Royal Commission report found that when it came to vetting people, which again, Nicole argued should be strengthened and the budget should be maintained for that, they failed to vet the terrorists correctly and then granted him a license. Now, for all we know, although it's been sort of black boxed until, I don't know what the black box years was, but it was a few years now, the person who signed and stamped his license and his ammunition would likely have been one of Cahill's members was an active serving police officers and most likely a member of his union. But somehow he thinks that, I don't know, we should focus on Nicole's lobbying and then ignore the fact that why are police technically involved in this when they were the ones who caused the problem in the first place? If we want to be consistent in logic, then Carhill would say, actually, police shouldn't be there either because they were the ones who directly contributed rather than making an abstraction that Nicole contributed. This is the interesting thing, too. He's complaining about a process that hasn't occurred yet and that it's going to be a truncated process or a shortened process for consultation, which is a bit rich, really, because he was front and centre justifying a three-day public consultation process for the 2019 amendments. And I know people who tried to submit uh, in that process and were denied a voice. And so it's a bit rich for him to come out and say that now. And then when you look at the overwhelming evidence that was provided in the submissions in 2019, it was against the thing, the very things that they then implemented. And the politicians just ignored people like you, people like me, who are experts in handling firearms, uh, are, are reputable members of collectors' associations, etc. They ignored all of our recommendations and then implemented this mishmash of really what I consider to be a, a grab bag of, um, you know, police hierarchy wet dreams on how to control firearms. Yep, exactly so. So it's funny that the other team tends to only cry foul when presented with a fair process that doesn't allow them special access or privileges over the rest of us. Cahill will still have the right to submit, as will all other New Zealanders to the law changes. It's just that he hasn't, I don't know, prioritized getting a seat on FCAF previously because he had direct access through a sort of, I guess, a soft or a patsy government. When it comes to those changes itself, I can't imagine that anyone on our team would be happy if we only had 48 hours of consultation on behalf of those who are speaking against us, because we need to ensure that all voices have a proper seat at the table and are heard if we want the new laws to last the next, say, 50 years and actually reduce gun crime in the way they promised us that these rushed versions after 2019 would. Clearly going by the media statements and the number of gun crime occurring, it has failed and we need to look at it again. It's totally failed. I mean, the 1983 um, Arms Act, I actually had a bit of a backroom involvement in writing some aspects of that. And, um, and it, was a good, it was a good law. But where it fell down is that the police wouldn't follow the law and they let things get out of hand and then they ended up with a government in the form of the Ardern regime where they could go and basically whisper their, their dreams into her ear or their police minister. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, which was Stuart Nash, of course, and then Chris Hipkins and then Ginny Anderson. But they got whatever they wanted, but they didn't actually go through the process of putting that leg or those changes to the law to the public. They didn't actually go through that process because they bypassed it using orders in council, which ended up with a mishmash of uh, competing interests uh, that uh, when you actually scratch the surface, don't actually stand the test of time. And, and you end up in a situation where, you know, that you had police officers, and, and this is still happening, uh, standing down the road from a gun uh, club, catching people who have come out of the gun club 
and then saying to them, can we look in your car? Without actually realising that they can't. <laughs> they yep. can't, by law, look in the car to see how the firearms are being transported to support their order in council, which said tra- firearms had to be trans. And, and that's a completely nuts uh, 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 regulation that someone who has a moderate collection of firearms that's going to uh, a, a shooting event would be in breach of automatically because you just can't, you know, secure that many mm. firearms in the car. It's just ridiculous. There's a lot of ridiculous things happening out of the police recently. Um, one of the ones that we've heard recently is a complaint or a letter that Colfer was sent on behalf of a airsoft range saying that anyone who wanted to run an airsoft, that is plastic BBs, uh, would need to have a dealer's license for the range and any of their staff that handled them would need an ACAT firearms license. That would apply not only to the BB guns for airsoft, but also gel blasters and paintball fields. Now, where is the logic in that? I understand that police would like us to move and follow the Australian uh, format, which they've stated recently as a result of, God, the, the funniest one that came out this week, which was almost missed, was that they want to ban CAD files for 3D printers that could allow criminals to 3D print firearms. Are they going to do now, that? <laughs> I mean, we, we haven't managed to beat piracy in films and music or any other area, yet suddenly we're now going to police CAD files. Um, how much resource is that going to take and how much is that going to be unsuccessful? Um, but the nice part of that was they admitted that, well, because of the register, quote unquote, the police and crim- sorry, criminals are now looking for other sources of firearms and 3D printing and manufacturing is going to be the next thing they're concerned about, as well as converting gel blasters, which is why they want to ban those. What didn't well, now that they're thinking of the export, what uh, I enjoyed is the fact that only 7% of all of the shipping containers that come into New Zealand are actually searched. So I'm not that great at maths, but 93% of them are bringing in drugs or firearms illegally as a, like, as a rough number. Every time we see drugs seized at the border because of the good work that actual police officers and actual custom officers do, there's guns in almost every single one of those deliveries. So the other one is only 2% of the firearms that criminals have seized, sorry, that police have seized from criminals had a serial number on them. So that is starting to undermine the register. And I'm looking forward to that coming out as part of this review process because police are going to have to justify why we're spending $200 million on this thing that clearly isn't working. Well, well anybody who's got a moderate collection of firearms and has interacted with the register knows that the register isn't working. And, and you know, I wrote about uh, my case. You know, I own a Vickers machine gun. It's a, it's a beautiful machine gun. It's in pretty good order. It's a pretty special one too because um, it was sold to the Egyptian army towards the end of World War uh, World War II. And in 1967, in the Six-Day War, it was captured by the Israelis. Hmm. Well, the Israelis had a mountain of... Uh, surplus ammunition from World War II, um, ironically from the Germans, uh, in 8mm Mauser. So they converted that machine gun to 8mm Mauser. So when I went to register it on the on the register, um, I could register a Vickers machine gun in 303 British, which is what the, most of them are. Standard. Were, standard. And yes, there was one there that I could register, you know, as this is the model and it's a, you know, a Vickers machine gun Mark one. They only ever made one mark, but that that's what it said in eight millimeter Mauser. And then it said to me, how many, what is the capacity of the box magazine? Mm. Now it wouldn't let me register the firearm unless I put a number in for the capacity of the box magazine. And anyone who knows what they're talking about knows that a Vickers machine gun is belt fed. Yep. It doesn't have a box magazine, and so I've had to put a number in there. Now I put 200 in because that's the capacity of about 200 mm-hmm. rounds. But I'm waiting for the police to come knocking on my door saying, where's your box magazine for the two, you know, with that holds 200 rounds, and why haven't you registered that? Yep. Because and that's how stupid the system is. The funny thing is the people who design, I've seen that exact problem where it gives you, you can't, put zero for magazine because obviously like you say it doesn't have one and it no. gives you the option between like one and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine and you're like yes so i have a hundred thousand round box magazine or magazine 
yeah. this makes complete sense but it just shows you the people who design the system okay sure they they might be very good at technology but they had no expertise in firearms and we spent a lot of money to get it I mean, I know a guy who's a senior member of the Antique Arms Association rung up by the police just two weeks ago. We're calling about this firearm. He says, I don't own that firearm. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, you know, no, that, this is the, a firearm with this serial number. And, and he works in the in the firearms industry. And he said, mm, that sounds like a, a serial number for a Ruger firearm, not a serial number for a Mauser. Mm. And, and they argued with him over and over again, and he said, well, you're just being too stupid and hung up on them. Um, and then he, But then he's got a notice being sent out for, for him. Oh, to- he's in breach. He's, he's an unfit and unproper person for not complying with the rules and arguing with police. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing that uh, Chris Carhill bangs on about and gun control and now that AstroTurf group that has, you know, Ox. Uh, Michael Wood in it, Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he uh, he's the same guy that told us that we're going to get a bike bridge for a billion dollars, so he's not really got any credibility, nor does he have any expertise in firearms that I'm aware of. But these groups all say that we need to have the register to stop straw buyers. And then when you ask the police how many cases of straw buyers have you come across, it's a single-digit number. Yep, it is 6%. Um, and that 6%. was from police figures that we ran a couple of years back through Colfo. We OIA'd it, and there was an ombudsman challenge. Uh, we ombudsman challenged, actually, because Cahill went in the media, it was on breakfast TV, he said that licensed firearms owners were the primary source of criminal weapons. And we're like, well, we haven't seen any evidence of that, and the numbers we've seen were counter to it. Can you please uh, clarify? Ombudsman then let us know that 4% of the criminal firearms that were seized were from were stolen and theft, and six percent were sold from um, from straw buyers, as you say. Now, I don't know how maths in the police or TPP work or the police association to separate the two clearly, but ten percent is not the majority. He then modified his statements a few weeks later to the primary identifiable source, which is a nice little loophole that still leads the average New Zealander to think that we're the issue. But when they dig a little deeper into it, they realize we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on a project that was addressing potentially 10% of the criminal supply line. That doesn't sound like a good value. No, but the other thing is they're using these percentages to hide the actual numbers because yeah. what they're saying is that 6% of those that they've identified in criminal activity, mm. but the way they say it, it makes it sound like 6% of firearms owners are involved. And it's not. It's it's a much. And when I say in single digits, it literally is single digits. It's it's under ten incidences of straw buyers, and they say that the 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 register is going to solve this problem. Yet every single person that they've caught that's been involved in a straw buying scheme has been caught before the register even existed. Yep. The only thing that will stop these criminals doing straw buyers or criminals purchasing firearms or using them to do harm in communities is good old fashioned police work. One thing that we look at is we have police officers who are looking to move to Australia and resigning from the force and we have an issue with not enough officers on the ground. With the current government looking to make uh, cutbacks in various areas and redirect it to essential services, you have to look at the register and say, is this a valuable use of money or could it be used to train new officers and then maybe give pay rises to those who are already doing the job to incentivize them to stay? That to us is a better use of money than a register that will never track illegal firearms, can barely track the legal ones and is already failing to be accurate and we're less than two years in. Uh, And again, the case in point is my own uh, situation. Mm. You know, I've I've moved a, a, a number of pistols off my license onto another person's license uh, simply for storage purposes, they're still on my license. Even though we've gone through a permitting process, a transfer process that was laborious on both parties' parts, if I lo- log into the arms register today, they're all still on my license. Yep. And it's sitting there. And what will happen is if a police officer comes to my place and says, we'd like you to produce this firearm, I can't produce that firearm even though it's on my license, even though I – like, and that's the other thing. With with pistols, 
You you can't do a transfer like an A category firearm where you can send the the transfer to another person and they accept it. It has to be done using members of the firearms authority. So they haven't done it. They haven't mm-hmm. done and completed the whole process. Well, that was three months ago. So you know, I know that's a mess. That's that's a number that's more than ten. Yep. Right. That 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 is now showing on two people's licenses. Yeah, and the problem will only get worse the more people start registering firearms. And most of us, I mean, are doing our best to avoid it. I know I'm personally holding off purchasing firearms or doing any activating ones because I don't want to go through listing. And my father as well. Um, Many New Zealanders who, especially those who live rurally where police officers are spread thin already, we know rural policing is a real problem with the South Island. I think it's like central Canterbury area has two police for the entire region. Um, so if they end up in trouble, if armed gang members turn up to their house to rob their homes, they're going to say, look, you know what? Take my guns, take whatever you need, because just leave my family alone. And I can't use them. put them in the car. Yep, exactly. You'll do whatever it takes to keep your family safe. And as soon as that, and it is a matter of when, not if that register leaks, I would wonder if we have a case to then legally go after uh, either police or those who administer the system for some form of compensation. Because the only way we can then protect ourselves is either get rid of our guns and make it public that we've got rid of them or move houses, which then would simply change the address we're living at. But it wouldn't change the fact that, well, you know, I already own these guns. So criminals could look up your name again and find you. It's, um, it's a really scary situation for any licensed firearms owner to be in. Speaking of scary situations for licensed firearms owners to be in, There's a case that's come up in the past week where a person who has a firearms license has an anonymous account on X or Twitter. It's a bit of a troll and, you know, he's had a few swipes of me along the way. Um, But he had uh, police turn up uh, on his doorstep uh, just after dinner time. Uh, All big cheery smiles on their face. And and he videoed this and, and you've seen this video. And all of a sudden started essentially threatening him where they said, we want to have a chat with you. And he said, what about? So we we don't want to talk about that. Can we come in? He said, no, I don't want you to come in. No, thank you. Don't want to be involved. And it turns out that they were contacting him using uh, a report to the firearms authority as, as a, an excuse to shake him down and suggest to him that perhaps uh, he's not being a fit and proper person by making outrageous comments on Twitter. Now, I've spoken to to this fellow, and he says, you know, I've seen some of his tweets over the time, and they're a little bit rude, but, but they're nothing terribly offensive. Mm-hmm. But we've got a situation where the police are rocking up, armed police are rocking up, saying there's been a report that you've, you know, essentially committed some hate crimes on Twitter and, you know, that's going to affect your firearms licence. And then the, the, I saw the, the constable say to him with a big smile on your face, you have obligations that you need to meet and we don't think you're meeting them. Mm-hmm. It's insane, you know, that you say something on social media and this is what's happening in the UK and it seems that it's come here now. Yeah, there are a couple of things to unpack here. And I think the first one is to actually praise this guy for his response. Mm. I would hope that all licensed firearms owners, now that they've seen this video or have heard about it, understand that police as it stands are not friends of licensed firearms owners, unfortunately. They used to be, but that situation has now changed, and we hope we can repair that over time. But in the meantime, the best things they can do is, well, the best protection is, unfortunately, grab your cell phone and start recording any of the interactions you have. Now, Ask them very clearly why they're there. Get that on camera. Don't allow them to speak to you off of camera. And if they insist on um, pushing for it, contact your lawyer and say, look, I'm happy to come down to the station and speak to you about these things, but I want representation. If you need a firearms dedicated lawyer, Colfo has some available um, that we use regularly and have quite a good success rate of getting um, licenses reinstated after they've been suspended. But it does come back to the idea that Police right now are judge, jury, and executioner, and what they say goes with licensed firearms owners. That's something that needs to change. 
the idea that things that you post on social media could threaten your fit and proper status is a real problem because yes, joke and parody accounts and things like that have always existed. Freedom of speech has some limitations. You cannot say, I don't know, cry fire or do something to induce panic in a crowd. Fair enough. That would make you a dick anyway. And you can't call for violence against someone else. Like I want to do X or I wish someone would do violence towards X person. That's never acceptable. And we can understand that, right? Um, from a licensed firearms owner's perspective, but simply making jokes or criticizing or stating an ideology that is against the common narrative, that isn't enough to define you as an unfit, non proper, or a danger to society, which is what we really need to factor in. Does someone's social media post make them a real threat and danger to the people around them if they own firearms? I can't speculate too much on this guy's post because I haven't seen a lot of them. Um, but from what I've heard, it didn't seem to me that he crossed that line. No, I mean, as I said, I've had interactions with him mm. in the past, and he's, he's what you'd call a troll, right? But the police turned up and were saying, well, we're, these are concerning. You know, they could say, I guess this is a safety issue. But if it was a safety issue, then wouldn't they be a little bit more forceful other than smiling happily and then turning around and, and leaving? So it can't have been a safety issue because here they were at the door uh, basically using implied threats, telling them to tone it down. That's essentially what they were doing. And then... You know, the, what she was quoting was in the legislation about his obligations as a fit and proper person has no standing in law. I mean, it it doesn't even exist in the law what the definition of a fit and proper person actually is, <laughs> right? Yeah, that definitely needs clarifying. And one of the interesting ones, and you made a great point there, which is if this was a genuine safety threat, police have the right without a search warrant to go into an individual who has a firearms license at home and take their firearms and put them through the revocation process. This clearly did not breach that, otherwise they would have gone ahead and do it. I've heard of that process happening for a lot less than um, social media posts. I've heard it happening because of ex-girlfriends complaining about anonymous email messages. Um, we've heard it about just phone calls from colleagues just saying, I don't, essentially like, I feel this person might be a threat and police respond very quickly to that. The threshold for that probably needs clarifying. Um, but if there was any form of actual threat to this guy, he wouldn't have his firearms license now. It would be a revocation. He wouldn't have his firearms on him. They would have taken that. So the fact that they just turned up very smiley, told him to tone it down, that's a concern. And I think this is probably only getting credit because he recorded it. I want to know how many other times and how many people this has happened to who didn't have a camera on them to record the interaction and didn't have the confidence to say, no, you're not coming into my house. I'd like representation or I don't want to interact with you. That takes a lot of balls considering having armed police at your house saying we're coming in and to say, actually, no, you're not. Yeah, full credit to this guy for how he responded. He was very calm and, and basically you know, said to them, no, I'm not interested in having this discussion. Don't care what you've got to say. And, you know, he actually asked them, am I under arrest? No. Am I being detained? No. Well, you can leave then. And, you know, the, you're right. This happens more often than not. And and I know Rachel Stewart went through a similar situation, and I know I went through a similar situation. Two armed police officers knocking on the door under the pretense of inspecting my safe. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I knew what the law was, and I said, well, you haven't made an appointment. Make an appointment, and you need to give me seven days' notice, and you can leave now. And yep. they threatened me. They said, this won't go well for you. That's what they actually said. Mm. And I said, mm, I'm prepared to take that chance. But if you don't stand up to them and actually point out what the law is, um, and, 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 you know, I've had – I've had uh, – uh, you know, firearm safety authority people at my house asking me to do things that are outside the law. And then I point out to them, no, that's not in the law. If you show me in the law where it says I have to do that, I'll comply. So here's the law. I've got it on my phone. Show me which clause that applies to that. You know, they were asking me to remove 
four stocks from my double barrel shotguns because that's what it said in their guide. Mm. Show me where it says in the in the law. And they and they could, you know, it's not a bad idea to um, as well as the storage requirements that we have for our firearms, which we all obey. Mm. Um, it's probably not a bad idea for most people just to print out a copy of the Arms Act. Just have it sitting on the top of your safe so that when they come in and say something, you say, right, here's the document and piece of paper. Can you just point to that where I'm in compliant? Like if I'm not complying as a licensed firearms owner, I want to make sure that I'm in I'm in step with the law. Just point it out to me. Otherwise, please stop asking. Because police policy, whatever they write, is not the law. Um, but for whatever reason, that line has become blurred and probably because they've built a nice little kingdom for themselves in firearm safety. Um, as uh, not administrate well, they have been administrators administrators of the law, uh, but enforcement. That's why we think those two powers need to be separated clearly. Yeah, and, and that's what uh, Nicole McKee and the ACT Party have promised to do: separate mm-hmm. those because there's a need for it. Um, the, there's too many stories of firearms owners who are being improperly detained or improperly questioned or improperly you know, put through various different hoops that they have to jump through that that aren't even remotely connected to the law. And then if you look at the success rate of the police in prosecuting firearms owners, it's pretty bad. You know, they, yep. they get before a judge and the judge is saying, why is this even here? And it's being dismissed because they don't get the law right. The police do not follow the laws they're supposed to uphold. Agreed. And the problem for us is, that once a licensed firearms owner who is not in breach of the law, but police have put them through this uh, mentally taxing as well as financially expensive legal process, we then spend our money on a lawyer and everything else. We maybe have our reputation damaged with our neighbours because we have armed police in their full gear and squad cars turning up at our doors, embarrassing us and treating us like criminals. After all that's occurred, we then get our licences back and they say, don't do it again in a letter. And it's like, A... We didn't do it in the first place, but also I'm out, let's say, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars of legal fees for what? Do I have no right of going back after police to say, look, actually, if you wrongfully prosecute someone or go after them and they're acquitted, then you must pay the legal fees. I wonder if that would be a step towards preventing this bullying behavior that we see from police towards licensed firearms owners. Yeah, I think that that would be very important. Um, to to have happen. Now, this this incident here is, a, you know, I don't see the media picking it up, you know, without smearing this poor guy. Um, but what we are seeing though is this concerted, uh, I'll call it proselytizing, because they're promoting a particular angle that they want to. But you see the police association, you see the police, and now you've got customs. I don't know if you've seen the video that customs released. Or, or was involved with the New Zealand Herald in having basically a moral panic about um, parts of firearms coming into the country. And in that video, this you know customs guy was obviously using rehearsed lines because he couldn't remember them. And uh, it, you know, there's classic tells that you can see that. Hmm. And he and he makes this statement. He said, "Oh, look, it's um, it's very serious. Like, for example." This was one of the example that is, for example, this is a cleaning kit for an M3 machine pistol. Yeah, and your eyes are rolling back in. Yeah. Your mind. Uh, There's no such thing as an M3 machine pistol. It's never been called an, a, a machine pistol. There is an M3 machine gun or submachine gun, right, mm. which, which was in, in World War II. But he was saying this is a cleaning kit for one. All cleaning kits are not a restricted or prohibited item. So why was it even being presented to the media in terms of the New Zealand Herald as something that was of concern? Hmm. I think one of the things that we see continuously from the anti-gun groups, um, police um, and the, and this, yeah, those sort of groups, is that when they do not have facts to back up their positions, they rely on emotionally misleading and manipulating the public and media to push their narrative. It's the um, Gun Control New Zealand's founder, Hera Cook, had a really great uh, debate line when she talked to a Canadian um, pro-gun group, uh, which was, I don't think we're going to get very far talking about facts. And I think that sums up the basis of their entire position. If they are asked to speak and provide evidence for their positions, 
They cannot. So they fall back on tragedies like Christchurch. They fall back on, oh, these MSSAs are coming back or semi-auto guns are coming back. And as we talked about on last time on your show, it's like these firearms never left. They're just more restricted. But when Mm. you say these to regular listeners, they're like, but they told us we were safe. I'm like, I understand that's what you were told, but unfortunately you were sold a lie in a very convincing and emotional package. We can't allow emotion to dictate the next set of law reforms. Well, in this this situation, this emotional blackmail, I guess, and 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 gaslighting that comes from the police and the and the anti gun people, has even pervaded pervaded its way into the minds of judges, because I know of a case that's currently before the courts, and the judge is saying, "Well, these are prohibited magazines. Why do you want to register them? They're prohibited," and that's the whole problem. Is the police came up with this, you know, nomenclature, uh, a name of of a type of firearm that was prohibited. Well, I don't know about them, but when I went to school, prohibited means you can't have it. I've got prohibited firearms, prohibited magazines, and um, restricted all sorts of other stuff. They're not prohibited at all, but this judge thinks, oh, well, you can't have it because it's prohibited. Well, actually, you can have it if you're a dealer, if you have uh, various different uh, prohibited Firearms license categories, uh, the most common is P6 and P7, uh, which is what I've got. You can have these, so they're not prohibited at all, which is your point. They haven't gone away. They haven't been destroyed. They haven't gone anywhere. They've just been moved into a different category. Yeah, And I mean, everyone's, they existed in a different category before the law changes under the ECAT licenses and all the rest of them. Mm. So this changing of language to benefit what is has to be political motives is something that should be cleared up as part of the new gun law reforms. Like we need to, because of rushed law changes and things that have happened over the years of progressive weakening of the original Arms Act, it's time that we look at that and say, look, we understand that over time and after the Christchurch terror attack, they were weakened. We knew that already because we see gun crime rising. They focus on law-abiding citizens and not punishing criminals. The justice system probably has a lot to answer for there, allowing criminals to plead down um, actual firearms crimes. So if we take it back to the drawing board, as Nicole McKee is hoping to, um, and we hope that the national government can also sort of have a bit of a backbone and support good gun laws, we hope that Mark Mitchell can likewise stand up against um, the likes of Cahill and those lobbyists to say, we want good gun laws that keep us safe. This is how we get there. And we want everyone to have a place at the table. That should be not a controversial position, but apparently, according to the media, it is. Yeah. Don't understand it. I can't understand this attack on Nicole McKee saying because she was a gun lobbyist, she shouldn't be looking into firearms legislation. That'd be like saying Mark Mitchell can't be the police minister because he used to be a policeman, or um, Judith Collins can't be the Attorney General because she's a a lawyer. It's an insane position, yet it's a position that they're um, pushing through the media. It seems to be the position that if you are an expert or passionate about an area, then you have no right to speak to that area. And like you say, it means that doctors are never allowed to be consulted or have a position in health. He can't be the health minister because he's a doctor. Yep, apply to any other area of government other than guns, and their logic breaks down, which means that their logic isn't sound on guns either. Um, and I mean, it's not like she's doing this as a, a standalone, un, without any other consultation or any other. Pro- the government process for setting bills and turning them into laws is well and truly established. It works for everything else. And people who are trying to undermine that process, whether it's Cahill or others, I think are more problematic to the diplomatic process than Nicole McKee, an expert in firearms, leading the reforms on gun laws. I mean, again, you've got to come back to what is the public risk. You know, and it's there's this perception that guns are a real problem, but actually more people die from motor car accidents than die from firearms by a long way, like by an order of magnitude of hundreds there's no need for this. It's like the the changes that the police pushed through under Stuart Nash around transporting firearms and cars. How many? If you ask the police how many cars have firearms been stolen from, they'll give you a number, and then you say, okay, now how many is it? If you exclude police cars from that, mm-hmm. uh, 
number, and, and the answer is almost none. So, yeah. so they're creating laws for things that have not and are unlikely to occur, but, but they put this moral panic out there that, oh, we need to do something because people are transporting firearms and cars. Well, we've been doing it f- since Adam was a boy. Yep, and, I mean, we had the same outrage when it came to the clubs and rangers changes. So the big, the big secret thing was an ordering council was done to reduce the reporting requirements of clubs and rangers who are mostly volunteer run. The things that were changed were specifically reporting their financials at the end of the year. Now, most clubs and rangers are either nonprofits or charitable organizations, so they report those financials anyway as part of their obligations under other laws. So it was mm. removing a doubling up of that process. That didn't need to go through a full consultation process with um, FIANS and everyone else, but they then complained they weren't involved. It's like, well, you weren't involved because you're not experts in the area. You're unaffected by this. And there isn't a public safety concern with saying, you know what? You have to file this piece of paper twice. And it does take a considerable amount of time for these volunteers to fill out and do. And again, how many, how many incidences... Uh, criminal incidences have occurred at gun ranges? I'd say the answer is zero. Yeah. I mean, Criminals even, even don't turn up to gun ranges. Yeah. If, even if you went to ACC and said, how many uh, injuries involving firearms have occurred at gun ranges? I, I would suggest the answer would be zero. Uh, we actually have those numbers, and I... I can send them to you after this, but it was the injury rates on both pistol ranges and long arms for the last 15 years. Yeah. Um, it was, as you say, it was marginal. When it came to long firearm ranges, when you exclude police and military, there were no incidents <laughs> of injuries at committing. When you, this is, this is uh, in the period that was obviously before the ranges were police compliant, quote unquote, as well as afterwards, and when you looked at the numbers, the most injuries occurred on pistol ranges, which were fully vetted and police compliant before the changes came in place. And if we wanted to be cheeky about it, you could say that actually you were more at risk being on a registered range than you were at an unregistered range based on the injury numbers. So the paperwork and the additional compliance that brought in didn't improve public safety at all, but it did give the impression that police were doing something about clubs and rangers because the Christchurch terrorists went to a rifle club a couple of times. It yeah. made everyone feel better. But again, it was a well-packaged uh, misdirection and uh, deceiving of the public. Yeah, and if you remove the police and the armed forces injuries from from rifle ranges or pistol ranges, then the answer is a very small number. And when you look at the number of people who are injured, especially like injured or fatally killed in New Zealand, it can be it can be relatively high until unfortunately you remove the suicide numbers. Once you remove those from the figure, it becomes relatively like it becomes a non-issue for us. Every death is a tragedy, obviously, and we don't want criminals out there doing harm with firearms. But it's not as bad as you think when you look at the media and see the multiple times that it's reported and the sensationalism around it. Because well, gun crime sells newspapers and it buys clicks. Yeah, there's an old saying in the media, if it bleeds, it leads. Yep, absolutely. And if it goes bang, then people will want to read it. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to to get you on the show to talk about those couple of incidences. I'm sure we're going to have plenty more as the heat ramps up against um, Nicole McKee and her attempts to get some sensible gun laws rather than the mishmash that we've got now. So, uh, you know, you're always welcome on my show to talk about these issues in, a, in, in the way that you have, you know, with yeah. facts, figures, uh, and, and uh, actual, you know, proof that this is what, this is the reality of the situation. And when we're hearing the media, uh, other media and the police and the various different gun control groups or, or grass, you know, astroturf groups like Michael Wood's one, uh, that they're actually using emotional uh, blackmail almost or gaslighting and almost none of their claims are stacked up by any facts. Yeah, I think final thoughts on this one is thank you for having us on. It's always a pleasure to sort of sit and have a level-headed conversation about the issues facing not only licensed firearms owners, but that can then be applied to all New Zealanders. But when it comes to the issues of the day, Nicole McKee has never been a paid gun lobbyist, despite what our opponents would continuously claim in the press. 
She has not only fought on behalf of strengthening gun laws prior to 2019, but she continues to consult with not only the pro-gun groups directly impacted by the changes that will be put into place as part of this uh, law reform, but also the opponents to ensure that everyone has a seat at the table, all the facts and evidence are considered, as well as the opinions and feelings of others to make sure that we're all on board with the law changes. And as it stands, there is no person in parliament who is more expert or qualified to lead this than Minister Nicole McKee. Anyone who has a problem with that should probably, I don't know, run for parliament themselves or make their submissions as part of the public consultation process and support the democratic process of lawmaking. And that is a very good note to end this chat. And Thank you. Thank you for coming on The Crunch again, Hugh, at at short notice. Happy to be here. Hugh is passionate about his hobby and interests, and he's certainly taking it to the police association. The way the police, the police association, and anti-gun lobbyists are reacting to a democratic process, letting those most affected by law changes have a say, is as rude as it is alarming. We need more debate, not less. Tell me what you think. Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.